कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्र पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिंग स्तुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवितयदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शातिशा हरि ओ Dear friends, welcome back to the study of the Mundaka Upanishad. We have completed the study of the first section of the first chapter, that is, Prathama Mundaka, the first chapter, and Prathama Khanda, the first section. It starts in such a manner. that we do not question the wisdom that is being now dissipated to the leader readers let me be very precise to for you the upanishad started by saying brahma devanam prathama sambhuva i can as a genuine student desirous of learning i can ask my teacher sir where did that wisdom come from is it some human's brain wave or it's a cock and bull story phrased in very articulate language what is it what is the authenticity what is the authority with which you are teaching me saying this is upanishad it is emanated from god and all that what is your i would say guarantee that this wisdom is an ultimate wisdom real and correct wisdom what is the guarantee that is why in the very first verse the upanishad kar says dear this wisdom has come from god himself brahma devanam prathama sambhuva he was the first self created and as you have now very well known and understood understand that there is always a relation between our experience and that experience has been projected to the divine what is it dears we go through four different phases of awareness i sleep if it is with dream i identify myself with the dream and while i am dreaming it is real we 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 feel afraid we feel angry we feel hungry where we are dreaming when we are dreaming it is real but that a dream reality of the dream state is negated by when i wake up and i look around me and i so thank god it was a nightmare it was a horrible dream Oh dear me it was a very pleasant dream how i wish it could be true but the awareness of the dream state has been negated by when i wake up so these are the two levels of awareness swapna and jagrata dream state and wakeful state then there is another state known as dreamless sleep shushupti where i am not aware of anything the world does not exist to me then all i have a faint recollection when i wake up 
from the dreamless sleep i say sukhamaham asapsam kinchinna vedisham what does he say oh i had such a deep sleep nothing existed for me the world had disappeared nothing existed but i was absolutely happy and relaxed sukhamaham asapsam kinchit navedisham the world has disappeared from me at that stage this is the third stage known as shushupti shapna jagrata deep sleep without dreaming shushupti and finally samadhi where by willful culture and discipline i concentrate my mind to that absolute reality known as sat swarup chit swarup ananda swarup atma and i have merged with that and nothing beyond it is all pervasive it is all permeating there's nothing left to be known this has been equated with the state of this cosmos anyway we'll come to that as and when it happens now in the upanishads in the previous section which we have studied the nine shlokas he says in question to the answer of that very enlightened well placed extremely successful human being is there anything by knowing which we know everything that was this question the answer was yes my dear there are two types of learning and each learning has an object one is apara vidya not so sublime but indispensable and para vidya is sublime and then the upanishad kar took up the definition of para vidya vishaya the subject matter where learning known as supreme learning para vidya where does it lead to what is the object and he starts defining trying to define as much as possible by proper choice of words from the negative aspect and the positive aspect a vague concept of what is the eternal what is the infinite what is the immutable absolute jaya tadaksharam adhigamyate what is that immutable he starts with that and he ends up on the ninth shloka ninth verse that the whole cosmos that you see has come out of it and goes back into it the rest appears to be real but they are not real the definition of reality is trikala avadhita gyanam satyam what is reality what is truth that which is not contradicted by the past by the present and the future three phases of time in all the three phases of time it is never never partition it is beyond that para vidya vishaya good enough dears and he has taken a para vidya and he has described it what about apara vidya now the question is the question is if i do not know apara vidya then what happens there will be always an inquisitiveness a disturbance in me what is that apara vidya he takes me straight to para vidya vishaya he doesn't allow me what to know apara vidya 
And what is Aparavidya? I have explained to you all the branch of learning that humans have developed during the process of civilization and time whereby they have mastered the external forces in nature. And that is what is known as progress of civilization. We have mastered enormous forces at play in external nature. Electricity, this, 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 endless. And we are still continuing to pursue and master, and we will continue as long as two people walk on this earth. That is what will happen. So, we have defined in general what is Aparavidya, those branches of knowledge which helps me to have a mastery on the forces of nature external to us. And that is what Opera Vidya Vishaya, that is this flow of life, this cosmos, this world, this universe, and we are product of this and we interact with it. I have not been told about it. So, and my question is, sir, uh, if you, I do not have a knowledge of it, how can I say it is not good or it is good? How can I say without knowing it? So it is for you to ed educate me what is opera vidya vishaya? What is the subject matter of that not sublime knowledge? So up till now what he has said, he has said there is something known as Opera Vidya, but he has not taken much time to define what it is. I have been defining you. How did he define? Jaya, what he says, that is, Rig Veda, Jajur Veda, Shama Veda, Atarva Veda, Shiksha, Kalpa, Vyakarana, Nirukta, Chanda, Jyotishamiti. Veda and Vedanga six ancillaries to study the Vedas properly and the Vedic literature. They are the branches of education where Opera Vidya is involved. Now in this chapter, second chapter, he introduces to you what is Opera Vidya Vishaya. Before I go into further detail, dear, it is required for your very clear, proper understanding. What is the subtlety? What is the game plan of the Rishi Upanishadkar, Maharishi Angirasha? How is he trying to develop this idea? <coughs> I'm sorry. He develops this idea in a very systematic manner. What is a systematic manner? He knows that to explain to us as of today, as I am now, to tell me this is the absolute goal of life, to be one with Brahman to manifest the potential divinity which is already within you. Very noble, very inspiring statements, but it has no impact on my understanding. It is far, far, far away from me. So the Upanishadakar, like a mother, feeds the children nourishes the children according to the capacity of being nourished by the children. Child food is different from adult food. And mother knows what food suits her child and she nourishes the child with that food. Opera Vidya is that food for us. We can't jump, and as I keep on telling you in my other talks, 
also in this Mundaka studies. We start our school from child care, kindergarten, primary, middle English, middle, higher secondary, secondary, uni, do graduation, doctorate, then further research. It takes 20 years. You can't be a research scholar right from your high school. You have to go through an education. And what is that education? Your faculties are being sharpened, are being honed, are being polished, so that with those subtle, polished, honed faculties, you can get hold the subtlest of the subtle idea. And then you will be taught how to absorb those ideas. Tada kara karito bhavati. How can be and become one with those ideas and manifest the divinity which is already within you, but you have no information about it as of now. So this second chapter, shloka dear, the, the second section dear, teaches you about Aparavidya. Now I speak to you from a modern point of view, this whole gamut of education, apart from the forces of nature that work within you, your faculties, your capacities, your abilities, apart from that, you apply them to understand that. Now, you are understanding the whole world of learning. You do not know who you are. Once you know who you are, the knowledge of who am I and the acquisition of knowledge that I can have completes. There is nothing more to be known. Having known which, having experienced which, nothing else remains to be known. To reach that stage, we should know what is Apara Vidya Vishaya. This is the introduction, dear. Now, he says, Whatever mentioned in the Vedas, Chotur Veda, and six ancillaries to the Vedas, Shara Vedangya, Shiksha, Kalpa, Vyakara, Nirupta, Jyotishamita. He enters. That's only words. What is it? Now it comes to the area of spiritual evolution of thoughts in Aryan society. I do not know when it started, thousands of years ago. Nobody can place in time. What is it to abbreviate it, to shorten it? I don't want it to be academic or pedantic, but let it be informative for you. Be well informed. You know the scholars, mostly in India and some of the Western scholars, especially German and English. They are very much interested in Indology, the science that has developed in Indian learning, and Indian rishis, munis, and authors. Lately, in the modern age, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, Dr. S. N. Dasgupta, Dr. Hiryana, and etc., etc., etc. They have written beautiful articles, booklets, known as Evolution of Thought Processes in India, in Aryan culture, Arya culture, Aryan culture. What is it? Let me place it before you in a nutshell so that you will understand what is Opera Vidya Vishaya according to the age of the Upanishads. Because you are studying the Upanishads, it was written several thousand years ago, and it was handed over 
to Rishi Angi Rasha from the voice of God till he received it from generation to generation. Parabaram, the teacher and the student. Para is the teacher, Avar is a student. From generation to generation, it has been handed over to us today. So what is it? A group of people known as Aryans, they are sons of the soil, they belong to this area. What was that area? That area was known as Aryavarta, Aryavarta, where the Aryans lived. <coughs> According to present day geography, it included part of Iran, whole of Afghanistan, whole of Punjab, what is known as Pakistan today, on the mountains in Himalayas, and down up to the Vindha Mountains, which separates North India and South India. Another culture, equally old, if not older, was the Tamil culture in Southern India. Now let us concentrate on the culture that developed in this landmass known as Aryavarta. What was the culture? In those days, life was not under such a pressure. Today we are always in hurry. And if you analyze for what? To fight for my livelihood. I have to earn, I have to live. I have to compete with others. That is what it is today. In ancient India, that was not so. One bountiful crop a year is good enough for the remaining 40 weeks of the week. 10 weeks of toil, plowing, sowing, nurturing, harvesting, enjoying the products of my harvest. And it carried through whole year. So people had enough time at their disposal. So with their five faculties of vision, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, they roamed about the nature. And basically, whatever he saw, whatever he smelt, whatever he heard, whatever he touched or whatever he tasted, why and how and where from came to his mind. Why is it bitter? Why is it sweet? Why is it this? Why is it that? The diversity brought into him the question of why's and how's. So dears, to put it short, life started for them as keen observers of nature and natural phenomena. They observed the sun arises from a particular point in a particular day of the year. Moves around, moves back, moves around, moves back. The moon waxes and wanes regular, no deviation, rises, sets. The six seasons, that area had six different seasons. The six seasons come one after the other with clock-like precision and regularity because humans did not tamper with nature. Ecological balance was maintained. And they kept on asking why and how and why and how. And. So from observers of nature, they thought of that these forces in nature, thunder, storm, torrential rain, floods, scorching drought, it's all in nature, it happens in nature. They so thought, what is all this? And it comes in such a regular manner. We see whatever we find in the world has a creator 
and the creator has a material cause and an intelligent cause and certain instrumental causes. As for instance, a potter must have a pot of clay, must have the potter's wheel and the stick with which he runs the wheel and his intelligence. So this seems to be a creation and it is running with clock-like precision. So the creator must be of infinite dimension as far as human faculties are concerned. Vala, Virja, Teja, Shakti, Jnana, Aishwach. Six aspects. Oh, he must be an infinite person with infinite qualities, these six qualities. And with that, he has created this cosmos. And if he is happy, if everything runs smoothly, my life prospers, I prosper. And if anything goes wrong, the storm will just kill me and wipe me out of existence. The flood can do so, thunder can do so, storm can do so, fire can do so. So let me propitiate them because my existence depends on their good humor. Let me keep them in humor. That is how the concept of worshipfulness arises. Observers of nature migrated or graduated into admirers and appreciators of natural phenomena. From there they graduated into concept of a supreme being, the Lord God, the creator of the universe, the creator, the preserver and the destroyer of the universe. These concepts slowly and slowly and slowly grew. And along with that concept, because they were absolutely pure in heart, they had no other occupation, as it were, but to run their household, plain living, high thinking. That was their way of life. Some of them wanted to know this is what the world is. But nowhere I find an answer to this question, who am I? Ko aham asmi, who am I? And a group of people started towards this journey. Am I this body? Am I this life force? Am I this mind? Am I this intellect? Am I this Sanghata, that is this multiple bundle of faculties? Who am I? What am I? And along with they found out, I say, my body, my mind, my life, my faculties, my intellect, my understanding, they are all mine. I am the owner. So who am I? And they started deeply thinking is, I know I am, but I do not know who am I. So one aspect was diverted towards knowing and unraveling or demystifying the mysteries of nature, external. And other group of people, they were not so much interested, knowing full well the Creator runs the universe according to His principles. Let us not deviate from the principle. 
let us follow it. But at the same time, I would like to know who am I, what am I? So one was how to live in this world, karma khanda or karma marga, and how to find out who am I, what am I, nidhi dhyasana, jnana khanda, anubhuti khanda. Knowing, understanding, experiencing. So the teachers, in short, divided the wisdom of the Vedas into two parts. Jnana Khanda, the section which deals with how to live in this world without violating the principles of nature which is palpable to me, experienceable by me. And I know I should not deviate from the principles let me contribute to it. Let me amalgamate myself with this flow. Let me be a part and parcel of this flow instead of sticking out like a sore thumb. Way of life. Right from the morning to evening. What should be my behavior pattern? What do I do? What do I should not do? If I have to do something, how do I do it? And the seniors of the society, they were not only senior by age, they were senior by wisdom. They created all these lists of do's and don'ts and how to do and how not to do. So when we study the Vedic literature, we find there are two distinct aspects of Vedic wisdom. The art of living in this world, which leads you to results, which you can enjoy in your subtle body and your gross body. But this is a chain. It keeps on going and going and going. Anadi Shrotavat Chakravat Parivartante Like a wheel it keeps on rotating and rotating and rotating. And the other, you break yourself away from it and establish yourself in the knowledge of your true original nature, the excellence, the majesty, the regality of your own being. Jnana Kanda. Jnana Mark. So, dears, in short, and this has taken several thousand years. I spoke to you in 20 minutes' time. It could have been abbreviated further. But to achieve these ends, the perfect decision and discussion and description of what is Aparavidya, where it leads to. What is Paravidya, how it is to be performed, what it leads to. These conclusions that we find in Jnana Kanda and in Karma Kanda must have taken thousands of years to arrive at. This is the evolution of spiritual thought processes in Indian society. Right from the dawn of history, much, much, much beyond all other religions prevalent in the world. This section of the first chapter, the second section of the first chapter, will speak to you about Aparavidya. Though it is not sublime, but what is its necessity? Why is it indispensable? I must know where this leads to, where that leads to. Just in a worldly example, you have two or three ways of reaching your destination. From this place, you want to go to Adelaide. 
about 1200 kilometers or 11 hours. The shortest route is about 900. And a longer route, which is beautiful by the ocean side and hills and dales and forests, is 1200 kilometers. If you don't travel by both the ways, how will you come to the conclusion which is more suitable to you? How will you? So, you must have a nodding acquaintance of what opera vidya vishaya is. Otherwise, how can you say it's good or bad? So, Matri Shama Upanishad, having educated the child properly, places before him. This is Karma Kanda for you, my child. This is Jnana Kanda for you. Study the Karma Kanda. See the plus points and minus points of it. Study the Jnana Kanda. See the plus point and minus point of it. Then decide which is the best. What is the best? Now see how, I would say, how subtly and how logically it has been placed before you. What is the best? To follow both the paths, you have to sweat it out. You have to work hard. Sadhana tapasya. You have to discipline yourself. Then only reach the goal. In Opera Vidya Vishaya, you do things according to the dictates of God's principles, which the Karmakanda aspect of Vedas defines perfectly. And you discipline yourself, you work hard, you don't go to the right, don't go to, and you perform. I perform, therefore I will be the enjoyer or experiences of the result of my activity. Good act leads to endless good. Bad act leads to endless good. But what is the biggest catch? What is the biggest point? <coughs> That which is created in point of time by human involvement with ancillaries and etc. creates a result in time and when you enjoy that result, it ends in time. You start from square back again. You come back to square back again. Start there. So, it is an infinite cycle, goes on and on and on. That is, Nadisrotabat, the flow of a mighty river, it is ever flowing, ever flowing. Goes to the ocean, is being evaporated by the sun, condenses into cloud, pours back into rain and snow, and it melts into spring and glacial river, and the cycle continues. Nadisrotabat anadi ananta. I have to that every but. I do good things. I have enormous amount of adrishtapala. Good deeds, virtues, takes me to heaven. I enjoy my bank balance there. If you don't earn and enjoy, bank balance comes to an end, you come back to square one again. You play the same game, you enjoy the same result, you come back again. Oh dear me, it is frightful. There is no end to this circle. Oh, I am not interested. Any man of common sense would say, oh dear, no. I'm not interested. Let me see what the Jnana Marga has to say. Jnana Marga says, you have seen this perishableness of the water, of the world. It is perishable. 
it is transitory, it keeps on starting from zero, goes to its apex, comes back to zero again, goes to the apex, comes back to zero again. And I'm tired of this unending force. What is the other path? You discipline yourself. You hear, you listen, Shravana. And whatever you hear and listen, you cogitate on it. Think over it, over it, over and over and over again. Oh, I am made in the image of God. If I can manage my faculties, if I can manage my sense organs, if I can manage that cosmic energy which plays in me as prana shakti, and I can manage to identify what is my true original nature, I will be free from this bondage. I will be manifesting the divinity within me. I become one with the Absolute. Adhigamyate abhinnataya prapyate. I merge with the Absolute and it is the end. And what is that place where, having achieved which, I don't come again? Jasmin gatva nanivartanti bhuya. Having achieved that, I don't come back again. I have identified myself. Who am I? What am I? And I have freed myself from the influence of Maya. I am Maya Mukta by the grace and kripa of Maya Adhisha Parveshar. Choice is yours. But, dear, not only an option, there's a procedure, as I keep on telling you. The procedure is, after you have finished your primary classes as a primary school, you have to go to the middle school, to the higher secondary, then you have to go to the university to qualify to be a doctorate, and then you can be a world-famous research scientist. There is a gradation. What is that gradation? Acquisition of knowledge, absorption of that knowledge, and knowledge is power. Capacity to absorb makes you strong to break the bondage of identifying yourself with this body-mind complex. You break it aside. Even if you like, I would like to follow Gyana Varga. It is not possible. You are playing with fire. You will be cheating yourself. You will be living in hallucination. You think you have achieved, you have not achieved. So what is the way? The way is and here comes another excellent concept of Indian way of life, Hindu way of life, the spiritual values put into day-to-day -day practice. A human life has been divided into four categories. One is Balyavastha, from the day you are born to you are five. You are cuddled, you are loved, you are darling, no scolding, no rebuking. Do whatever you like. Balla was the five years. Then the next ten years, six to sixteen, you have to go to your teacher's home. No more, I would say, spoiling you. Go to the teacher. And from six, a year six to year sixteen, you be under Brahmacharya Ashrama. What is a Brahmacharin? Brahmani Charati Iti Brahmachari. That is, you are taught, you are educated how to live in God, 
with God for the sake of God that too to receive the blessings of God. Nothing but God in your life. God in the external forces in nature, Agni Devata, Varuna Devata, the fire God, the water God, the earth God, the sound God, the lightning God. Don't deviate, live up to the principles of nature and conduct your life in such a manner that you are honing, sharpening, disciplining yourself so that you settle down, you marry, you live a worldly life, you bring up a family, raise them, but your life is anchored to the dictates of karma kanda. This jaga, this jagya, this brata, this upacharana, and so on and so forth. Your life is managed after Brahmacharya. On the 16th year, Guru asks you, now go back and have a family. And live a family life. And then you live a family life, you become successful, you become accomplished, you get an enlightened, and you settle your family, and a time comes when the children are grown enough to manage their show, Panchash Ordham Banam Brajet. You leave all that behind. You and your wife go and live in seclusion away from the world. And that is the time you don't have anything. You live on begging or having fruits from the forest or you go to a habitat to ask for a handful of food. Bhaiksha Charjam Charanta, he will tell you. But you now convert your life full of upachara, full of things, addendums, when you do jaga, jagya, homa, and etc. You see, you have to have so many things for which you have to have money. Now, as a bana prasi, you don't have all that. So you convert the performance into mental performance. I think I have invited God and I am offering myself. God is present there, no more in a gross manner, in a subtle, imaginative, mental manner. And after performing Manaprastha for a year, ultimately, you perform sannyas. You offer to fire to purify yourself all that is relevant to this body and the world interaction. Biraja, Bipapma, Jyotiraham, Swaha. I am taintless, I am sinless, I am effulgence in itself, and I am as pure as fire and I burn away all dirt and grass, and I merge with the Absolute. These are the four states of life mentioned in Indian way of life and living, known as Ashrama, Balya Ashrama, Brahmacharya Ashrama, Garastha Ashrama, Banaprastha Ashrama, and ultimately Sanya, Atya Ashrama. It is beyond the ashramas. Now, dears, he will teach you. Let me introduce it so that you know what you are in for. He will now teach you how to perform the duties of a garast, grihastha. Along with it, on the 12th, 22nd, and 12th shloka probably, no, 22nd shloka, if I am not wrong, Pariksha Lokan, yes, 12th shloka. Of this section and the 12th shloka, last but one shloka, the student, having seen that, he 
cogitates within himself. What does he say? Lokan Pariksha Pariksha Lokan Karma Chitana Brahmano Nirveda Mayat Nasti Akrita Kritena. He introspects, he thinks deeply. What is the end result of Karma Kanda and the way of life? And what is the end result of Jnana Kanda Sannyasa? What are they? I am now sitting to assess and to evaluate. What is my evaluation? I find the worlds of goodness which I enjoy in heaven that I have created in point of time by my involvement and with other elements involved, I create an adrishta palaha and enjoy that. And while enjoying it, it diminishes and disappears and I am back to square one again. Akrita Vastu Kritena Nasti That is, that immutable, that infinite, that eternal absolute cannot be had by that process of creating something in time which will always give results, which will perish in time because they have come up in time. They cannot be eternal. And I have spent whole life on that. And what I have gained, I have a good time in heaven, I come back again. And I know what life is. And on the other hand, if I can manifest the potential divinity in me, nothing like it. I have done it for all times to come. Well, well, now I have balanced it, weighed it in the balance of advantages and disadvantages, and I find that is more advantageous for me. I'll go for that. And how do you go? You are a very well-versed pundit and academician. You know Vedas, Vedangas, and all that, Upanishads and Aranyakas and everything. But however academically excellent you may be, you have to go a guru who will teach you how to walk that walk. Guru Eva Avigatche says, Tadvigyanartham, to know how to reach that goal, Guru Eva Avigatche, he has to go to a guru. And what is that Guru? Who is he? Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam Guru Upagachet. This is what the student's duty is. And the last shloka of this section will be when he reaches his Guru, Guru is bound down by his responsibility to share his wisdom of Brahmanjyanam with that student who has gone through the drill and who is fully prepared. He never looks back again to the world. He goes on to his onward journey. So, dears, in these twelve shlokas, second section of the first chapter, with this second chapter, a uh, second section, the first mundaka will be over. But, what happens in the first section, the Acharya Upanishadkara has established <coughs> the concept of Paravidya, Paravidya Vishaya, Aparavidya, Aparavidya Vishaya. And he has told you what is Paravidya Vishaya first, because that is the ultimate goal of life. 
you may like this going and coming back over and over again. Why? You want to enjoy the joys of heavenly life. You might, I would like to see what the uh, heaven is. What is the joy in heaven? Eternal paradise living with God. I would like to see that. Go and have an experience. And then after that is over, you come back to this miserable world again. And go through that grind. So a time when comes when you say, enough is enough. I've had enough of it. I'm tired of this unending farce. I'd rather spend my time and energy by means of which the result is eternal. And what is that result? Removal of ignorance of myself. It is not a creation. It is a removal. When a mirror is darkened by dirt, you don't create the reflectivity of the mirror. It is there. All you do is to wipe out the dirt and put the mirror back in its property. You wipe out the dirt of understanding within yourself that I am this body-mind complex. You are not creating anything. You are removing the dirt. What is in you, as soon as the dirt is removed, it blossoms forth. This is how the second section of the first chapter ends. So, dears, I give you beforehand the essential education that is inbuilt in the second chapter. Why? Because in almost all of the ten chapters, you will hear about Karmakanda, how to light a fire, how to arrange the timber of the fire and how to put your ahuti there, how to do it, when to do it, how not to do it, as strict as possible of disciplining your life. No freedom. And that discipline builds up your personality. And that discipline tells you, I am not going to look back again. That strength of character, that strength of conviction is being created by opera vidya to be utilized for para vidya. So you see there how logical, how rational, how robustly commonsensical it is. So dears, let us stop here today. But as we are studying it, let me read the first verse of the first shloka of the second section of the first chapter. Ditya Khanda Prathama Mundaka Tade Cha Satyam This is apparently true what I am telling you. Mantreshu karva, Karmani Kavayo Jani Apashan Kavaya, Kabi. Kavaya is plural. Many, many, many of the rishis, Kranta Darshis. What is Kranta Darshi? Those people who pursuing this goal, who am I, what am I, what is this world and all that, who have learned the secret totally and he has experienced it. He is Kavi. And there are endless numbers of rishis in our society. So they have seen what they have seen, Tretayam Bahudha Santatani. They have seen in the Treta being the three Vedas, Rig Veda, Yudur Veda, and Atharva Veda. Shama Veda is only music, how to chant the Vedic literature. Anyway, these three Vedas and also the Treta Yuga. That's when Rama was born, that is the time. It is all found there, and the Rishis have found out the secret of that wisdom. And he's teaching you how to behave. Tani Acharataha. Please 
make it your conduct pattern your behavior pattern niyata in a very regularized disciplined manner satkaba he who is desirous of truth you you are desirous of truth you have taken this life come i'll teach you niyata satyakama eshava pantha sukritasya loke this is the method which will take you to those areas of enjoyment which you create yourself by following these instructions tani acharatha eshava satyakama niyatam satyakama this is a path to your enjoyment in heaven this is how he starts the second chapter a second section of the first chapter prathama mundake ditiya khanda this is india we will now with this background develop the study during our next classes thank you dears thank you ever so much i would like to make an announcement and let me take advantage of this i have been receiving many 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 emails and letters and messages what are they appealing to me not to stop these online classes after the restrictions of pandemic is over well classes will be held as it was being held beforehand but as long as i can physically make physically make it possible as long as my body and mind is able to dear friends i will not spare myself to be with you and share the little learning that i have had from my ancestors as it were the various swamis the realized souls in their own right i will share my little learning with you whatever it is worth to you be assured i'll not let you down thank you dear thank you ever so much om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna arpanamastu